So thanks for ha having me in here. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about BAT, uh, bipolar androgen therapy. The, the funny thing, Brad, I think when we did the hackathon for me back in February of 21, um, we all knew about this thing, but it wasn't even in the decision. Uh, it wasn't even in the top five, you know, things for us to consider, um, partially because I think it's perceived as so dangerous. You know, you throw a bunch of testosterone into a guy and it's like putting gasoline on a fire, you know? So um, we never considered it, even though it was in the back of my mind, for sure. And so I want to just tell you about my success story with this and then talk a little bit about um, why I think it deserves more attention and, and scale. So <clears throat> if you go to the next slide. Okay. Uh, I'm just pulling it up now. Oh, okay. Yeah. Boom. Tell there we go. Me. Yeah. See a little thought bubble? Hmm. Is it a game changer? I think it could be. Um, so yeah, if you go to the, the next slide. <clears throat> okay, so what is uh, BAT? It's, uh, again, bipolar androgen therapy, and it's really designed to, to shock, to repeatedly shock the prostate cancer cells. So you're alternating between a polar extreme of high and low testosterone levels. So as you can see on the graph on the right hand side, this is from the John Hopkins study. There was like four different studies that they did on this and they were using 30 day cycles or 28 day cycles actually. Uh, and so they would inject somebody with 400 milligrams. Um, wait, are you guys hearing this? I just got a, yeah. a sonic. Okay. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> so you, they would inject a guy with 400 milligrams of testosterone and it would go up pretty rapidly, I think over the first two weeks or so, and then it would, you know, start to drop. And so you're alternate, you know, again, you're alternating between, you know, they call it super physiological T levels and then castrate levels. Um, and that was kind of the gist of this thing. Um, so to understand this though, a little bit more, I want to talk a little bit about baseball. So if you go to the next slide, um, you know, using an, an, anal, analogies is always good. It's an easy way, you know, metaphor and stuff and an easy way to think about things. So um, let's just kind of talk a little bit about the androgen receptor and androgens in general, and we'll use a baseball analogy. Okay. So think of the androgen receptor, which is on the cell surface of the prostate cancer cell, right? So these, you know, think Same of them as catch Peter's MacBook Pro. Now connected uh -oh. to Peter's MacBook Pro. Hey, there's Pete Kane. His beautiful hair. Sorry, guys. I thought I thought I was on mute. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, I, I don't think it's on the surface, but okay. Doesn't matter. Okay. What you wait? You don't think he's got beautiful hair? Is that what you just said? I do have beautiful hair, long curly hair, especially after the no. Uh, <laughs> no. I, I learned that the androgen receptor is uh, in cytoplasmic. So, oh wow. Okay. Well. Well, at any rate, um, you know, your prostate cancer cells has androgen receptors on them and they bind to androgens. So think of androgens as baseballs, androgen receptors as gloves. So when you get an, when you get an actual binding, that's when it folds in the nucleus and starts to rapidly divide. And that's when it generates prostate cancer growth and PSA progression and all that stuff, PSA production. So if you know, you take away testosterone, which is what we do with anybody who's in stage four, you know, you, you give them Lupron or Eligard. What you're doing is you're taking away the baseballs essentially. So the gloves don't have anything to bind to initially, at least, right? Because it usually works for everybody for a little while. And then cancer figures out, figures out how to grow despite having low levels of testosterone. The other way you can gum this up is using an anti-androgen like you know, er darolutamide, apalutamide, ensalutamide, and think of that as maybe like throwing an orange into the glove. So you kind of gum up the receptor, that way a baseball can't bind into it. I just want to give you this, again, think of androgen receptors as gloves, testosterone, essentially androgens as baseballs, because I'm going to, I'm going to use this when I tell about my story a little bit. Um, so if you go to the next slide. <clears throat> okay, so why was I a good candidate for this? Um, well, 
I was heavily pre-treated. So this is like my 13th line of therapy over the last eight and a half years. Um, I've seen ADT since 2014. And uh, I failed abiraterone. You'll see that in the next slide when I get to it as well. So I've already been on first line and second line hormonal therapies. Uh, so I'm, you know, castrate resistant. Uh, from a genomics perspective, you can actually see that I've got AR copy number gain. So I have high levels of baseball gloves, right? So, you know, when we took away the testosterone and then when we added abiraterone, that's when I definitely saw the AR copy number gain show up. So, you know, my cancer evolved. It was like, okay, not very much testosterone here. So we're going to add a ton of baseball gloves and try to scoop up any kind of baseballs that we can find. So I have, you know, high levels of AR. I also have a P53 alteration, which um, in the John Hopkins study, that was, it's estimated, there's a hypothesis that, you know, people with BRCA DNA damage alterations and P53 alterations, in addition to AR copy number gain, probably do better on something like that. Um, I also, you know, shared ownership with the oncologist, right? So, you know, uh, Dr. Raina McKay hadn't done this before with anybody. She wasn't going to just, you know, she wasn't going to do this unless I came in and said I wanted to do it. And so it was going to have to be a shared ownership between the patient and the oncologist. I think because this is not being scaled right now, it's, you know, John Hopkins did it, you know, Oliver Sartor has done a little bit of it, you know, maybe a couple of doctors across the country have done a little bit of this, but it's not being widely used. And so I think it's going to require that patient to be brave enough, right? You know, you're throwing testosterone on this thing. It could be like throwing gasoline on a fire. You got to be brave enough to try it. Um, and you have to have a doctor that's going to be willing to support it. So a couple other real quick notes, um, different than the John Hopkins study, I'm doing this every six weeks. So I'm not cycling on 30 days, I'm cycling on 45 days, so every six weeks. And I'm also adding pembrolizumab to it. And the theory is that um, when you add testosterone in this type of a supra physiological, you know, high level way, you are turning on some of the immune function on the prostate cancer cells. So you know, I honestly don't know how much of my success is, is attributed to Pembro versus testosterone, but I am using both. Um, the other note that I've got to say is that I did have a major pain flare um, after the first dose. So you'll see as I talk about this, it's been all upside. It's, I, I'm living my best life right now <laughs> on this stuff. This is great. Like testosterone, what guy wouldn't want testosterone? Come on, right? Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm loving this therapy, but I did have a major, major pain flare. It was excruciatingly painful, um, for about three or four days after the first cycle. When you read the John Hopkins patient guide about this, they talk about if you're symptomatic, if you have bone pain, um, from cancer, you're really not, they, they don't really want people with, with bone pain to do this. They, they consider you symptomatic and they don't really want you to do it because they think it's going to be really painful. And it was, it was super painful, but it went away. I did a high dose of, of, of uh, steroids for five days and then it went away and I haven't had it come back on the second and the, the third. So I just want to throw that little note of caution out there. So if you go to the next slide, um, I just wanted to put this up here just to show you, uh, this is, you're, you're gonna see a dramatic drop in my PSA from this thing. Um, I just wanted to put this up here. These are all the different treatments that I've done and kind of the way my PSA resulted afterwards, right? So, you know, everything from ADT to chemo to um, multiple PI3K inhibitors, you know, Provenge, Abiraterone, uh, the, the, the actinium stuff at New York, in New York city, another PI three cave inhibitor, you know, the cabazitaxel carboplatin. And then I got to a point in April, 2022, where I was just like, fuck, I'm at a 300 PSA. Like I'm in trouble. And I was just waiting for something that could potentially save my life. So if you go to the next slide. <clears throat> so this is what happened to me. So I start, uh, the bat with Pembro and we measured it after the first cycle, six weeks later, my PSA drops from 307 to five. We do it again 
and the PSA drops from five to 1.79. I do imaging after my second cycle leading into my third cycle. This is on the right-hand side, this is a PSMA PET scan. So what I want you to look at on the left is look at, look at my legs and my pelvis and hip area. Look, look at my kind of sternum and, and chest area and then look at my head on the left-hand side. Now look at the right-hand side. The stuff on the head is gone. The, er, the stuff on the chest is going away, it's lighter. But look at the pelvis and the legs. Look how light it is, right? That's PSMA uptake. So it's like literally starting to erase off of my body. I used to have pain in this area. I, used, I was even a little bit wobbly with, with getting up off the couch and stuff. It's all gone. All that's gone. Like, I don't feel any pain. I don't feel anything bad. Like, I just feel good. I had from, 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 uh, from chemo and from actinium, I had pretty much permanent nausea and fatigue and I had no appetite. Uh, I lost 20 pounds. I went from 170 to 150. Uh, I was just like really going in a bad spot. I got rid of all that. I have no more nausea. I have no more fatigue. I don't, ha I have an appetite now. I got more muscle mass. I got up to 170 again. I'm not even exercising. I just gained, you know, muscle mass just from testosterone. Uh, sex is better. You know, it's like all, all upside. Okay. So if you go to the next slide. <clears throat> okay. So some other study results. So um, on the last page of this presentation, I took a picture of the actual patient guide. So if you want to like Google it and find it and download it and read it, you can. I could also, Brad, I could just send you the, the PDF and you could stick it in the notes too for people that want to read about it. Um, but there were four John Hopkins studies on this. Uh, um, and what they show in the studies is that patients kind of fell into three categories. They either um, had a PSA response, and that response was usually a 50% drop. And then also, uh, you know, um, they would notice that on scans that some of the cancer was going away, and this lasted for months. There was a kind of PSA stable uh, cohort as well, like people that actually had a little bit of a bump in their PSA, but then it flattened out, and they didn't progress. So they just kept them on bat as well. And then you had a, you know, a cohort of, of folks that actually progressed. Their PSA went up right away. You know, it didn't work at all, right? Um, but in patients with, um, with CRPC that were progressing on Xtandi or Zytiga, about 33% had a PSA or an objective response after three cycles. And that duration on average was about six months. The other thing that's really interesting about this is that um, bat can restore sensitivity to hormone blocking therapy again. So it's like a twofer, right? You get the bat, which in my case had this dramatic response. And I'm also resensitizing myself to hormone therapy again. So I could redo this. That's what's cool about this. Like, not only do I have bat right now, but if I start to get a rise in PSA and if I start to progress on imaging, I can go back to Zytika, I could go back to Xtandi and get some more mileage out of this. And what I've wrote, wrote, wrote down here was some of the exa examples that you read in the report. So for patients, for example, who received Xtandi and then they went uh, to BAT and then they went to Xtandi again, right? This should never work, right? Once you build up resistance to Xtandi, it shouldn't work. But if you go to Xtandi, BAT, and then Xtandi again, 70% of these people had a PSA response with the re-challenge, okay? For patients who went Zytiga and then Xtandi, no bat, right? Just from Zytiga to Xtandi, 25% would have a PSA response and the time to progression was four months. Their overall survival was 29 months. For those, for patients like that, if you went Zytiga and then before Xtandi did bat and then did Xtandi, 80% had a PSA response, time to progression was 11 months and they had a 37 month OS. So that's just like super cool. You get bat and you get resensitized onto some of these second line hormonal drugs. So you just get extra mileage on this stuff. Um, 
So I wanted to kind of stop for a second and let Dr. Gattenby, you know, kind of weigh in and see if he has any response. And then I've got a last slide on like discussion. Um, so let me just stop for there for a minute. Bob, <clears throat> Bob, did you want to comment? Uh, well, congratulations on, on a very thoughtful um, uh, um, and well-designed strategy. Um, Thank you. You know, I think it illustrates the point that um, if we understand the under underlying dynamics of cancer, we can we can develop therapies that are based on that even far into the into the disease. It, it um, you know once. So let, let me just back up. So we, we have a protocol where patients just presenting with um, uh, can, metastatic cancer, prostate cancer, and we do androgen deprivation therapy, but we do it cycling. So, and we cycle it based on the PSA. So that um, basically uh, when the PSA goes below 50% of its pretreatment value, we stop, we let it come back. And what we've learned from that is that the um, the body begins to produce testosterone very quickly after that um, and continues to do so. Um, and we have patients who continue on that for nine years, uh, or I mean, they are still, you know, nine years later are still on it. <laughs> so um, that that's a, a fairly simple, you know, on off, on off, but, but guided by the dynamics of the patient. We don't, we're not forcing it, you know, not arbitrarily just on off at three months or four months. We're, we're, we're watching the, the, we're letting the tumor tell us when to do that. What, what you've done now is, is you're far into this process. You've been on androgen deprivation therapy for a long time. And what we know is that if you stop androgen deprivation therapy, you will not get the testosterone coming back immediately. It's, a, it's in a fairly long time, perhaps a year or more. Um, so the, the bad thing, is the, the, the idea of losing testosterone as a kind of a driver you know, is, is really very good at this point. The fact that you had the, uh, the duplication of the androgen receptor means, it, 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 is, I, I think, is exactly what you thought, that, that the androgen level, you know, your testosterone level is really low because of the ADT, but it's not zero. There's there's some around, right. and they're going to they're going to um, upregulate their receptors to to get the the signal so that they can proliferate. Um, when you give them suddenly a whole bunch of testosterone, um, they are probably I mean they they seem to die, and probably it's because. Um, you're forcing them into proliferating when the environment is not up to this. I mean, we we can do the same thing with estrogen. If we if we put the uh, a breast cancer in a in a low oxygen concentration, for example, it will downregulate the estrogen receptors, and the reason is because it can't survive proliferation at that point. If we force it to upregulate the, the estrogen receptors and give them estrogen. They all die because they're they're trying to proliferate in an environment that they can't. Um, now it may be more complicated than that, but but in any case, you know you're you're getting one a certain amount of cell kill, probably from the testosterone itself, and then um, you know you and then you're and then you're also getting uh, some effect from the decline. So um, it's very good. I, it, you know, unfortunately, I I don't think most people get that response. Um, but you, but you, I think very correctly got the information that you needed to predict that this would work. Um, and I guess that's what I would argue is that um, you, it's a great example of a, um, you, you know, that we, we talk, we, we talk about uh, precision medicine and often that, that, that's really talk, that, that it's really a very narrow um, definition of it. You find a, a, mutated gene or something that's a target that you can you can treat but you really looked at the evolutionary status of the tumor you know it's it has responded to the various things that have, that have occurred and it's a very complex way but it's 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 done so in a way that that now has there's an achilles healing and mm -hmm. you can attack it and i think um 
very much that's what we try to do uh, to use evolution to understand you know what's going on and then tweet from there. So uh, one of the strategies that that we've used is what's called the double bind therapy, where you you push the tumor in one way, but you know that the way it adapts makes it more vulnerable to a, to a second line therapy. Um, an example that that we've seen is uh, immunotherapy given to uh, against p53 in small cell lung cancer. Um, they they actually develop a very good uh, immune response to mutant p53, but they didn't have a it, it had no clinical effect. But when you follow that with chemotherapy, uh, where when historically the response rate is five percent or less, and we got a sixty five percent response, you know what 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 happened was that the that that the adaptive strategy to the to the immunotherapy made it vulnerable to chemotherapy, and mm. those are the kinds of things that we want to do. Um, the the question for me then is. Um, you know, that's what's happening is great, but what do you do now? Um, if you keep cycling, um, you know, are you going to drop the P, you know PSA lower and lower so that your you're, the population of tumor cells is smaller and smaller? <laughs> but but one of the things we know with prostate cancer is that it's really hard to eradicate it. You know, the ADT that's typically given at the beginning of of treatment um, will will normalize the PSA. And sometimes make it undetectable in ninety percent, you know, plus of the men, and yet it's never cured, you know. Yeah. And so the question is, um, you 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 know you you put the tumor on the mat basically with this. Um, could this be a curative, you know, um, maneuver? Uh, I think it's unlikely. It's possible. So, do you want to treat for cure, uh, which in this case might be to add, you know, an this is this is the extinction therapy now. Do you want to now add? You've got a small population. Small populations are vulnerable to extinction, but usually you need the the final nail in the coffin is usually not the same uh, thing that that drove it down originally. So so one you know thought is: Do you want to add something to the to this at this point when you've got a small population? An alternative is to stop what you're doing now and just let everything kind of come back and then start the therapy again. Um, but I, I, the, the only thing I would just caution you about is that as good as this result is, there, you know, if you, th there's this concept of, of, of evolutionary rescue that, that you know, you're, you're, the tumor is probably pretty diverse. And even if there's a small population that's resistant, um, you know, at, at some point, it's it's going to come back to bite you. And so yeah. now think in terms of, you know, you've got a great result. Um, think about what to do next uh, in the context with an expectation that that there will be evolutionary rescue, that 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 there will be a small population that's resistant, and and it's very small compared to what it was at the beginning. So so it was you have a the the, the sensitive cells. In the absence of treatment, have a tremendous fitness advantage, and you you know that because they were by far the dominant population before you started therapy. And but there probably is a small population that's resistant, and then the question is, how do you want to manage this in a way that you can go you know down the road years uh, and and you know maintain control of the tumor? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's fascinating. I think. You know, a couple couple things on that. So, uh, one of the things that I've seen. So, I did I did another liquid biopsy after I did the first mm -hmm. cycle. So, you know, six weeks into this thing, and what was really interesting was, you know, the genomics have changed. Mm -hmm. So, in two in two ways. So, mm -hmm. and I'm not surprised. Like my AR copy number gain is gone, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I think what happened is when I flooded it with testosterone. Yeah. So both Foundation of okay. Medicine and Tempest, both FMI and Tempest, that, you know, and I think what's happening is, you know, I, I introduced a large oh. amount of testosterone. It mm -hmm. starts shedding the AR copy number gain alteration. Sure. Guess what else? Guess what else it shed crazily enough? Mm -hmm. It shed my PI3K alteration. Like, mm -hmm. 
I thought it was fascinating though that like you know these alterations that I used to have I don't at least at yeah. least on the lipid biopsy and I will both FMI and, both FMI and Tempus are are calling that the only thing I still have is P53 like all these other alterations are but let me be clear right. that that is not there's no reason to be optimistic about that that result I am pessimistic about that result because mm. it's, I think it's exactly what you said that you've selected for you, you your therapy has selected for those cells with multiple copy numbers and you and you've done a great job of killing them but you're but if you're still detecting tumor you're detecting this it sounds to me like you're detecting a small resistant population yeah i think so and, and, i think so and so that which is okay so we know it's there um but we have to take that into account as we design the future therapy doing the same thing over and over again is simply going to give that that population time to proliferate well uh, and so then i think that that's where you could get into an adaptive thing right exactly. so like for, well in, in a different way and another another thing that we could do and this is what john hopkins is starting to look at with uh future studies is so you know right now you know i've seen this rapid psa decline uh treatment over treatment like someone third i haven't done you know seen post third cycle we haven't measured but i you know 300 to 5 to 1.5 and radiographically, you can see that I've, I've had improvement. At some point, you're right. At some point, if I just keep doing this every six weeks, we're going to see the PSA start to rise. And when that happens, I could just introduce darolutamide or, you know, Xtandi and bring it back down again. And then once I get to that point, I could reintroduce BAT. So I could essentially cycle between BAT and second line hormonal therapy, go back to BAT, second line hormone. You know what I mean? I could keep cycling that way and probably it's, get. It's possible. I, I just would be, I, I'm, you know, we'd have to think about that. Let me just throw in another plug. This is where, you know, evolutionary models are very helpful um, to, to, to sort of work through that in computer simulations and see if that would work. Um, yeah. I'm, I, I like the extinction. I like the extinction event idea that you have. My only concern is that I've already seen, uh, I've already seen carbo. I've seen cabazitaxel. I've seen docetaxel mm -hmm. and those things, you know, like my cancer's figured out a way to, to become somewhat resistant to it. So, uh, I, I, I don't know what the extinction event drug would be, uh, if we were to go down that path. Um, small um, populations are, are, inherently oh, uh, uh, extinction um, and even uh, applying a drug to which they're resistant you, you remember now that they have to uh, deploy resistance mechanisms to, to be to be resistant and that's going to cost them energy and and they have to divert energy from some other source because they're in an, a tumor environment that's that's got very poor resources um, you could add an anti-energetic, which um, you know not is not terribly effective in a large tumor population in, in prostate cancer, but there is some evidence that it's effective in smaller populations. Um, so this just just to just to keep that in mind is that um, that, that the the goal is to exploit this the, the small population vulnerabilities, and so yeah. so I would agree that. You know, you you made a mess of this of this tumor population. So God knows what's what's in it, and that's that's always the problem. Um, but what's almost certainly in it are uh, are cells that are resistant to what you've done. Mm -hmm. uh, so so what can, can you walk me through then? What what you would suggest if you go if the um, if it progresses? If yeah, say, yeah. So yeah. Well, so what the, the the, the plan right now is, uh, and I don't, so I don't know if we, so what John Hopkins would say is they would, they would let the PSA progress up to where it started before you started therapy. So they would let it get up to there. And then once it progressed beyond that, then, you know, they would introduce Xtandi or darolutamide or some anti-androgen to stop it from further going, Right. I, for me, you know, I went from 307 down to one. I don't know if we wait to get up to 307. I think we don't need that much of a, no, of a you know. But right? why, why not reinstitute the, the, the bats? Well, so 
I no, so, so I would stay on. So for example, I go on oh, to you would stay on it until it went up that high. Yeah. Or or goes up to let's say it goes up to half of that, it goes up to 150 okay. or something. It's you know, clear signal that the hormone sensitive cancer is really starting to get stronger, right? right. So, because so, I'm on yeah. But when stop the bats. What was that? Why not just stop? Stop the 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 cycling. Stop the bats right now. Just yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's what we would do. Yeah. So sorry. So just to be just to be clear, the plan is, if we see a lot of progression of PSA or radiographical progression, we stop bat. We introduce an antiandrogen. But why not stop it now? Ah. Uh, and then start it again when the PSA goes up. Oh, okay. Well, I can tell you. So this is what I am seeing because I did some I did mm -hmm. some mid course PSA checks. Mm -hmm. So what's happening to me right now is that the spike in testosterone is very good for me. When I start to drop, and you can see it dropping in kind of week four and a half, five, mm -hmm. definitely by six, I'm starting to get towards castrate levels. My PSA does start to inch up a little bit. Okay. So when so when I get down to cash rate levels my psa because it that that's what my cancer loves it it knows how to co it knows how to exist and thrive in a in a okay. low testosterone environment so i am seeing it slightly bump up but then when we introduce bat again it just slams it right back down but but right so but you see that um so you're punishing its adaptive strategy to low testosterone okay yeah. all right so so at some point you know, that you're punishing that strategy. So it's going to go away. So there's going to be a new strategy that's evolving. So yeah. the, the, the population that's got upregulated uh, um, uh, um, receptors are presumably what you're punishing. Yeah. Right. And, and you've, you just did a, a serum markers that suggested that that's declined. Um, and which makes sense that, that you that population you punished enough that you've reduced it. So, um, but you know that beforehand, before you started, all this, that as soon as you gave testosterone, these guys died like dogs, right? And so, which means that 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 population, in the absence of your therapy, is is um, fitter than the resistant guys. So it's, if there's a small population left and you stop, that's going to come, come back up again. You could let it come back up again. In the process, it's going to be uh, suppressing the growth of the resistant guys. And then you can start bats again. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. That's interesting. We could definitely try that. Okay. I don't know if I have the, I don't know if I have the cojones to do that because right. So, so, yeah. Yeah. And I'm sorry, just walk me through what you think. So if you continue the bats and you now get resistance and the, and the PSA goes up, what do you think is going to be the properties of the resistance cells? I think they're going to be um, not so much castrate resistant, but they're going to be hormone sensitive. The original cancer cells that love testosterone, it's going to be that those cells that start becoming the herd boss again. Is what I think, mm -hmm. because you know, every six weeks I'm introducing testosterone again. Up until you know, for up until now, when I introduce testosterone, it kills all of these castrate resistant cancer cells, which are the herd boss today, mm -hmm. I think. But at some point, the hormone sensitive original cancer cells will start to take over, because they once mm -hmm. I introduce testosterone, they're going to be like, because. I can see it in the, in the genomics already. If, if, you know, I, I know Ryan and I were just chatting about this, but on the, on the, on the liquid biopsies, I'm not, I'm not generating any, at least the cancer that's coming up in the liquid biopsies doesn't have AR copy number gain anymore. So th those cancer cells love testosterone, I think, and they will eventually learn how to bind because I think what's happening is the bipolar nature of this thing, you know, like it, like it sees testosterone, it sheds the androgen receptor, it's too busy, like, you know, shedding all these alterations that it had. And by the time it figures out what to do, the, the testosterone's dropping already. Mm -hmm. So it's like really confusing it, you know, but at some point it'll learn how to not be confused. 
and it'll start growing again. And if it does, then these are kind of hormone sensitive cells that I think I could stop with darolutamide or Xtandi, yeah. yeah. right? And then, and then once I, and then once I'm effective stopping it with a second line hormonal drug, because again, like I said, in the presentation, you can resensitize the cancer to the second line hormonal drugs again. Right. Mm -hmm. So I introduced Xtandi or darolutamide. I have some success that way. And then I introduced bat again. So I'm, I'm kind of thinking to cycle between bat and second line hormonal drug, bat and second line hormonal drug, you know, that, Mm -hmm. that could be my adaptive strategy if I don't have an extinction event strategy, you know? Yeah, I, I guess my the, the my concern is that you're that will you be selecting for um, androgen uh, independent growth? Um, and and I don't know. Um, I, I hope you're right. Uh, I, again, these are these are just to be clear, these are very complex dynamics right now. So mm-hmm. it's going to be you, the question is, are you going to, there's the, let, let's say, let's just call it free population. And there's one that's got a lot of androgen receptors on its surface and it's vulnerable to increasing testosterone level. Perhaps there's another population that has a normal amount of androgen on its uh, androgen receptor. And um, I guess what you, you would say is that that, when you give testosterone, does that population proliferate? Eventually, I think it will. Eventually, it will. So, but as as you're killing off the, you know, in this pulse up of of androgen that you get, you're killing off the the cells with a lot of androgen receptors. Um, Correct. Then, um, are you? Do you think you're you, you're causing the um, and the the ones with let's say normal amount of androgen receptors? Are they proliferating at that point? Um, I don't think they are yet, but I think that is the natural. I think that is the evolution. I think those will go back to being the ones that proliferate. And when that happens, then I can just introduce a second line hormonal drug again and get a bunch of mileage, I think. All right. So just what, just one concern. And then, uh, you know, I, I could be wrong. These are, these are very complicated things. If you see the PSA rising when the, when the, um, androgen normals go down. Um, That could be, so I think you interpret that as being a proliferation of the cells that have sort of a normal amount of androgen receptor. Is that that what you're saying? No, 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 I don't think so. I think think that's the high high end, the uh, overexpressive. Yeah, yeah. I think think there's, you know, there's a little bit of them still that haven't been killed off. And um, those guys, are very comfortable growing in a low testosterone environment. So when my, when my, you know, in the six week cycle, when my testosterone levels drop, at least what I'm seeing, and I, and I can tell this because I've looked at the PSA, like my lowest PSA is probably in week three and a half to four. Mm-hmm. At week six, when I get ready for the next cycle, it's bumped up a little bit, you mm-hmm. know? And I, and I think, you know, what's happening is, I'm at this low level of testosterone. There's still some cells that are like, yeah, I love that. You know, mm-hmm. we know how to grow in that. Mm-hmm. But then when I, but then when I slam more testosterone into my system, those get killed even further down. Cause I saw that go from 300 mm-hmm. to five and then to 1.5. Right. So mm-hmm. I'm slowly killing them. Mm-hmm. I might see on my next cycle that I'm down to zero point something, you know, like it might just continue to kill them. Mm-hmm. But yeah, eventually, I don't know if it'll be a year from now. I don't know if it'll be six months from now. Like at some point, the high testosterone, it'll start growing in despite of high testosterone. You know, it, it will learn how to do that. But if it does that, then I can just introduce a second line hormonal drug and slam it back down again, because that's the cycling thing that I think I can do, you know. Um, but I'm really, you know, Bob, what 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 frustrates me is that there are, there are a ton of people out there with stage four metastatic prostate cancer Mm -hmm. who have been highly treated like me, who would have probably similar dynamics with the engine receptor who could really benefit from this. That's and nobody, and nobody's getting it, you know, and if it's Brad, if you go, no, and and I, and I agree. And I think, you know, Brad, like, I kind of want to get into a little bit of a discussion, like, um, 
you know, so if you go to the last slide, the discussion slide, so this, this ridiculously amazing treatment costs 200 bucks tops, right? Somewhere between 50 and $200 to get 400 milligrams of testosterone every six weeks. You know, like Xtandi costs $10,000 a month, right? So, you know, no pharma is going to push this because it's, it's, they're not making any money off this. This isn't something they newly developed, right? And, you know, a lot of oncologists are incentivized to push the FDA approved drugs. They're incentivized to drive the new clinical trials. You know, I, I don't know what the best way to raise patient awareness for this is. I don't know if we should like find some organizations that are really helpful in driving patient access for, you know, there's a ton of patients out there that don't have good insurance that don't have great money that could benefit from something like this. Um, I'd love to get the team's feedback on like, what's the best way to scale something like this and build more awareness so more patients like me can benefit because this, this is criminal to like hide this, you know? No. Yeah. So maybe if I could just jump in here for a second, because, um, Bryce, obviously we've been talking a lot about it and it's just absolutely incredible what your response is. So as I looked at my options, um, that was one of them. And I talked to Raina. So for those who don't know, um, Bryce and I share the same doctor. And she was resistant to pursue it because she said that I had just moved into a castration resistant setting and she felt that it was too soon to go after it. So I think that we need to kind of identify um, who are the best patients that will respond to this. It would be great to get, I know Bryce, you said AR uh, copy number gain is great, TP53. Um, you know, talking to Raina now, how long do you have to actually be, you know, castration resistant before this therapy will work? What are the other dynamics that we need to consider um, before more patients can respond like you? I think that we need a, a little bit of due diligence on that. Yeah. Or like, maybe it's one of these things where, you know, every oncologist has, you know, that set of patients that have exhausted a ton of stuff who are running out of options. The oncologist is even scratching his or her head, doesn't know what to do. You know, they've probably failed ADT and second line hormonal therapy a long time ago. Like give this as an option. Like, why not? Like wh why, why not try this? You know? And uh, yeah, I, I just don't know. I, I don't, I don't know if this is like a mass educational thing that the oncologists need to, to get more aware of. I don't know if you go through zerocancer.org and you push it through them because they have a large, um, you know, set of patients that pay attention to their, to their message. Um, yeah. I had a question for, uh, for Brian McCloskey. Um, I I'm learning a lot about that. So I'm, I'm a little bit lower on the learning curve than certainly a lot of you, but um, it seems odd to me that you, your same shared oncologist would tell you that she's hesitant to to do that because you've just recently gone castrate resistant. I mean, why don't, I guess I don't really understand what the rationale would be behind that. Well, her, her, her perspective was like, Bryce has been castration resistant for several years. And so she felt that, you know, I, I'm still a little bit hormone sensitive and then I've really got a little bit more mileage with, for example, I'm aber on abiraterone right now. So she's kind of like stayed the course on abiraterone right now um, before, we, before we get into, you know, uh, this type of therapy. Yeah, I kind of, okay. I, I, I kind of, I, I kind of think that she might be onto something there because it would be different if, if Brian was showing resistance to Abby, you know, like we're on, on imaging, you could see cancer was growing and his PSA was rising then he's really CRPC, you know, like ADT doesn't work. Second line hormonal therapy doesn't work. Like then he's entered into the same kind of realm as me, but right now he's responding. So you could make an argument that maybe it's not the right time, you know, <laughs> but, but so but here's, here, well, sorry, one, one more, one more quick thing on this, right? Because uh, Bob, you and I had a little off uh, offline conversation about this um, yesterday too. So ARV 766 is one of the treatments that is um, in line for me. How would um, an AR degrader 
work with BAT down the line? How do we think about a strategy for how those actually work? It seems to me if I went on ARV 766 and I degraded my, my AR, I have less mitts to actually catch the androgens. True or not? Can, can I make a, I, I'm sorry, I just want to make a point that um, it, it's, th these are nonlinear dynamics. Um, human, the human brain is very good at linear dynamics. It's, if X gives you 2Y, 2X gives you 4Y, you know, and, and, and that kind of linear, but, but, when there, but cancer is a nonlinear system. And so it's very hard to intuit um, what's going on with it. And, and, and I think that, you know, Bryce showed this example beautifully that he, he got information on the intratumoral uh, evolutionary state of, of the cells. And the, 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 uh, the, the, the treatment was appropriate for that state. Um, and I, I guess this is obvious, but we, we need better biomarkers to understand how evolution is going on, what has selected. Because you know, we, can, we can debate whether the, um, the, the bat therapy is going to select for uh, cancer cells with the normal amount of receptor or whether it's going to be, it, it's going to um, do androgen, it, it's going to select for androgen independent growth. But, but we need to know that. Uh, in planning, you know, treatment, and uh, you know, we when you get into these very complex situations where people have been treated with multiple things, it's really hard to anticipate what's going on with it, or to and or to predict accurately the results of a perturbation applied to this nonlinear system. I want to interject as a time manager here. We've got about five minutes left. Um, Bob, uh, are you at a hard stop at the hour here? I, I am, yes. I, okay, then, then I would like to make a request. We, we had sort of had as a sub agenda having you review Brian and Rick's situation. And uh, we'll, we'll talk with you, see if we can get another time slot. Brian is, I think Brian, you're um, on the 17th or something like that. Um, yeah. are, you, are, you next, so are you next Wednesday? Mm -hmm. I think I'm next Wednesday, yeah. Yeah. So, Bob, we'll see if maybe you could join us then and we could review Brian's case. So I, then I want to uh, allow there are a couple hands up. And I think Emma was interested and Rick is interested as well. So hands up uh, if you could use that feature. And Jonathan is up next. Um, I just wanted to note that uh, the problem with that, there are no predictive markers of response. There is it's really. Uh, difficult to say who might benefit. We're all guessing. I mean, there are a couple of reports that patients who have mutations in the HRD pathway, like BRCA1, and actually even TP53, tend to respond. But I think that people who administer BED, and I mean people at John Hopkins, should probably start collecting data and looking, looking at them systematically after they conducted four trials and probably patients who are treated off trials as well. Okay. Yeah, Thanks yeah, I, on, on that note, oh. so that that on the patient guide, they talk a little bit about that, Emma. They, they yeah. talk a little bit about how- um, Wait, I saw the patient guide, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they, you know, it's like early, early hypotheses is that DNA damage repair, BRCA, T53 might be synergistic, you know, AR copy number gain looks like it's really synergistic. Um, I know that Raina is sharing my response information with the John Hopkins team because mm -hmm. I, th I think there was only, from what Raina was telling me, maybe one to two, maybe three people max out of that 300 or so that were in it had as dramatic a response as me. Like I'm, I'm very rare in the, in the, in the precipitous drop of PSA, you know? Um, so they're, they're trying to figure it out. But. Well, fortunately, you're one of the most sequenced people, so you have a pretty, pretty long, well documented <laughs> biological history. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. J Jonathan yeah. Starr, you've been patient. Uh, what, what was your question? Thank you. Um, yeah, Bryce, thanks for this uh, uh, talk and uh, fantastic these results. I'm really Thank happy you. for you. Uh, one, one small point I want to bring up is that uh, you're talking about your plan going forward. Um, you know, there are a number of 
uh, other drugs in the pipeline, some of which are looking kind of promising. Uh, 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 what Brian mentioned, ARV 766 is one of them, another is Veru 111. There are others. And so, uh, you know, instead of having to plan your entire future going forward, you know, you could look at this as potentially just a bridging to when other things become available. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, uh, yeah. So for, just for to sure. Throw that out there. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, I think I'm buying tremendous amount of time with this. I, I was a little bit worried that I would see my way out of 2022, honestly, um, before I started this thing. So I'm just ecstatic that uh, I'm buying at least, a, I feel like I'm buying at least a year of time, if not more, to for these new things to come on and then hopefully, you know, onboard something else when I need it. Um, but yeah, you're right. There are new things. And that's the, that's the thing. Tomorrow, tomorrow is better than tomorrow, right? When, when you're fighting this disease. So. Um, Saeed is next. Saeed. Thank you. Very interesting result. Actually, I believe maybe the theory behind that test testosterone effect on the prostate cancer is wrong, was wrong. And they were based on some limited knowledge. Uh, we, uh, is it okay, uh, Brad? Uh, can I share something here? Uh, okay, quickly because we only have a minute left, and Rick okay. wanted to say something. Yeah, this is this is the a simulation of the data, one of the public data related to the prostate cancer, right? And I use twenty genes here. This is a model. And I have testosterone and doxorubicin, which is those at the cell, what they saw, that's a doxorubicin, the same drug. Now, I just uh, showed the effect of testosterone on this data. I just added one unit, 1% here. I applied this one, you can see this down-regulated genes, 20, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven upregulated genes by testosterone. Now I change testosterone to doxorubicin, same amount. I reset it and apply it. And you see, it's a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. It easily shows the effect of the testosterone can be close to doxorubicin. And I believe we have a problem with the knowledge of the the way testosterone works. That's thank you. Thank you, thank you, Said. Um, that that probably is worth a, a follow-on conversation. That, that that looks pretty intriguing. What you've got there, uh, Rick, Rick. Real quick, uh, <clears throat> I've just read this book, "How to Starve Cancer," thanks to Robert Ellis, and uh, I feel. Uh, and, and they go, the author goes into and uh, how to starve it and then how to kill it with ferroptosis. So uh, I kind of wanted to mention this to Bob. I never heard of ferroptosis and some of the kills that are being described in the book is along the lines of Bob, you push towards extinction <clears throat> and then uh, actually either introduce a uh, <clears throat> a bolus of free radicals via intravenous vitamin C, which is like, what? And then, uh, and saying that the <clears throat> remaining cancer cells cannot uh, tolerate uh, what is normally thought of as bad as, you know, abundance of free radicals. Uh, evidently, according to this author, the, the cancer cells are more sensitive and you can go for a kill shot. We can go farther into this, but I just wanted to mention a metabolic axes that I'm, I'm frustrated, you know, like everyone is reaching the end of the genomic and the gene expression um, way to kill cancer. And I'm, I've got to be so happy with Bryce, but I'm trying to add another dimension, come yeah. at a different angle to be synergistic another day, but I wanted to introduce that. And well, Bryce and Bryce, Bob's. Bryce and Bob, how do you Bryce and Bob, how do you react to the idea? I was thinking that it's not not on the let's call it the androgen vector; it's something else from the side. Would 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 would, would that uh, would a metabolic approach possibly be useful? 
I think so. I, I would encourage people to um, look at the uh, website from Christopher Gregg, G-R-E-G-G, -E -G, who is a neuroscientist at, um, at the University of Utah. Um, he's also a cancer patient um, and has done uh, extensive research in uh, exactly this kind of thing, the, the, the use of various um, metabolic approaches. I think, um, you know, when, when, when you're trying to kill something, you, you, you know, you, you don't, it's not the time to be selective. You know, if you find something you can hit it with, then you do it. And I, I think metabolic, um, uh, you know, strategies are perfectly valid and, and should be integrated into the more classic set of toxic things. And Chris Gregg, has, he's done a great job of um, looking into this. He's a scientist himself and has presented data that's available on different strategies. I, I would encourage people to look at that. 